Raylene, my question relates to a, a publication that you quite often contribute to the Arena magazine from Melbourne. In their last issue, they were going on about technology, technological change in universities, and the writer told the anecdote about how his first lecture of the year, there was one tape recorder where there was a spare seat, and the second week there were 10 tape recorders and there were 10 spare seats. And by the end of the, 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 the session, there were 90% tape recorders taping the lecture and only a smattering of students. So for the very last lecture, the lecturer himself didn't appear and he just had it up on video, his lecture. How is technological change being used to further the corporatisation in the context of you know, of growing class sizes and more online learning? Uh, is the, is the, um, the, the teaching face-to-face -face a thing of the past now and is the quality of teaching going down as a result of that? And my question to Maury very quickly is, you might have seen the Herald this week with a demonstration from the Greens and other people against the tape cutbacks and then the following day we have the ACCC announcing that all these privately funded uh, colleges uh, have been rorting the system for millions of dollars. Now I know at the Granville at least all the refugees could no longer enrol in HSC or English language classes because of the increasing tape charges and I also know they've shut down 27 tape colleges this year and they intend to shut down another 35 next year and they just they've made hundreds of millions of dollars selling them off for private developers. Could we have some response on those two questions? Yeah, well, if we have a few hours to go into the issues around technology, I think what's happening in universities is very interesting on this um, count. And it illustrates, you know, probably a fairly common view of technology, which is that technology itself is not the enemy, so to speak. It's the way it's used. And the same technology can be used for democratic purposes or for authoritarian and, and commercial purposes. Um, and, you know, distance uh, technology is a good example of that, the internet and the capacity to, uh, to teach uh, on screen at a distance. Um, that can be a tremendous thing. I mean, we in Australia have a long tradition of inclusive distance education. School of the Air, Kindergarten of the Air, and you know the um, uh, rural um, education by radio is a you know grand inclusive tradition. Um, but you can commercialise this, and of course with MOOCs, massive online open access, supposedly open courses, um, you have a, a commercialised uh, distance education model, which has fascinated. Uh, Australia's corporate university managers, not that they've made any money out of them yet, yeah. but you can see the dollar signs in their eyes and the, the cash registers ringing here. Yeah. Um, similarly, um, the, the way uh, computer technology can be used within organisations, um, you can use it um, as, as a means of you know, democratic discussion to include you know, considerable numbers of people sharing information, uh, doing you know, collaborative teaching and so forth. But it can also be used for social control and that's the way it's principally being used in certainly the group of eight you know, self-elected elite universities are now uh, increasingly, attempt, management is attempting to control the staff not by face-to-face -face discussion or issuing commands, but by setting up online systems that control teaching, research, a whole lot of areas of life um, in a kind of automatic, impersonal way. That's what disturbs me, I guess, that kind of use of technology. But it's also true that you know, there are amazing democratic possibilities uh, if we can you know, get the the social energy and the, you know, organisational cloud you know, to develop them. Yeah, thanks for the question on TAFE, uh, uh, <coughs> Jefferson. Um, 
Well, the Gonski founding model for schools is really um, uh, a rejection of neoliberalism. It's about growth, uh, a, a government having a growth budget in education. Um, and it's, when we look at what's happening though in TAFE, we have a, a very, very different situation. Um, and, and we've got to just call it. It's unlikely that we will have a public TAFE system within the next three to four years in this country. Um, enrolment growth in enrolment in Victoria is now down to 25%. In South Australia it's about 26%. This came about um, unfortunately because of the Gillard government, the COAG agreement that was negotiated in April 2012, which went to a full-blown contestable funding model. The contestable funding model is just nice words that say the governments will no longer guarantee fu uh, direct funding to TAFE. It's just a, it's saying that all funding now has to, you have to compete for it. And you compete for private providers. Now I can go on a lot about it and, uh, and every state and government signed up for it. We, the union, uh, we spent uh, an inordinate amount of time in Canberra appealing to the then government that this is an absolute disaster. We can't it's begin to tell you how bad it is. And of course, we were told that um, we were just uh, dinosaurs that were living in the past and we're trying to protect bloated bureaucracies. But we already know now that uh, what has really effectively happened. We've got essentially what's happening is this massive transference of public wealth that was once invested in a public institution for common good being turned into uh, private wealth and shareholder wealth. And so we see now, if I could just give you an example, vet fee help, which is, vet fee help is, is, uh, is not help um, at all. It's actually called debt. And so we're putting some of the most vulnerable people in our community, uh, if not the individuals, them and their families, and particularly working class kids and their families, into massive debt. That debt is effectively is a loan scheme which is not capped like even the HEC scheme at the, in higher education. In that debt in, in 2008 was $26 million. That's a lot of money. This year, um, we would predict that it'll be nearly $4 billion. $4 billion of uh, students in the debt sector in debt to the tune of $4 billion, of which a lot of it will be doubtful debt. It won't, it's not insensible in terms of government policy. 75% of that $4 billion, 75% of that $4 billion goes directly to for-profit private colleges. They are now making, they are now making somewhere between 30 to 35 cents in the dollar of public money goes straight into profits. So, we're, so their profits, a third of their profits are coming straight from the public purse. At the same time, we've reduced funding to TAFE in New South Wales from 16% in the last decade. Nationally, we've reduced it by 25%. And this is the neoliberal, this is what neoliberalism does. It's, it, it, it effectively, it has to destroy the success of a public enterprise. So if it's the ferries in Sydney, you stop employing and, in, and training marine engineers, as they did, the ferries break down. You then say that the public sector can't run ferries. And then you say that private enterprise has a solution. And, and the same with any public. You have to destroy the notion that public sector can't do it well. And you do it through funding. So you reduce funding dramatically. Um, and that's what effectively has happened. And the solution is to go to contestable funding models. So we see now um, that it's probably too late in Victoria and South Australia. South Australia went from 75% guaranteed funding for their TAFE system to about 24 or 26% guaranteed funding uh, under a Labor government. It went from that, it went from those figures in nine months. In New South Wales at the moment, uh, it was around about 22%, 20, 21%, 22% mark of, of uh, contestable funding. The last budget that we saw in May handed down by the Baird government our figures show that it's about 33%. Well, we don't, we won't know until the figures are released, and we simply will not know the level of contestable funding in New South Wales. So uh, the TAFE campaign, I know it's a distraction in terms of, we're talking about Gonski tonight, 
but it really is about public education and uh, what was really uh, a source of pride for our nation that we had a, a, a level of education that wasn't necessarily in the school sector, that wasn't in the university sector, that had a very high equity component, that educated working class kids, that was an engine room for small business, if you like, but also a second chance education for so many people. Their chance to get back into schooling if they left school early it was also uh, had a high uh, social equity component in terms of their community obligations. All that now is essentially at risk. And in terms of their own membership, we, we believe we've lost about two, uh, since 2011, about two and a half thousand teachers and support staff have been sacked in New South Wales alone. Can I thank both the speakers for a wonderful, really interesting talk? The focus has been on social justice, and social justice is incredibly important. But the fundamental issue in education is the effectiveness of learning outcomes. And my view is that is where these policies of neoliberal people amounts to a fraud. There are scores and scores of studies that show there is no advantage in, terming, in terms of learning gain by sending kids to other than government schools. None. And I'll just mention one study which has been not very well quoted, which is no surprise to those who study this. So the large, quite a large group, about five, four or five researchers from the University of Queensland. It used data from the Australian Ch Children's Longitudinal Study. It used incredibly sophisticated statistics and it showed what I just said, that there was no gain other than by inputs. That is to say that the gains from, to independent kids, kids at independent schools and so on, including Catholic, comes mainly from the fact that the schools select the higher socioeconomic background. It showed there was no gain. What it did show was the gain from home. What I want to know is this. Do you think that the campaign could make more, take more advantage of the outcomes from economic studies rather than the out, as well as the outcome from social uh, justice issues? I think the, the broad view of, of education researchers is along the lines that have been suggested that the, um, you know, if you like, the technical effectiveness of private schools is no great advantage over um, the, the technical, if, sorry, uh, over the, there is no, um, no, not superior to the technical effectiveness <laughs> of public schools. Um, but the, in, in a sense, that makes neoliberalism irrational. Um, yes. Now, it's unjust, but it's not irrational uh, because there are other outcomes from education apart from, if you like, the measurable uh, learning effects in terms of tests and examinations. There are collective outcomes. There are outcomes in the shaping of the public culture that we live in. And those advantages, those gains from privatisation are part of what neoliberal policy makers have wanted. So I actually think that the, the segregation effect is intended. It may not, may not be formulated anywhere as a policy goal, but it is actually the collective intention of the privileged classes who've driven this whole system in, in Australia. And until we're really willing to face that kind of uh, both, you know, in, in, in academic terms, structural issue about our society and in more personal terms, gut level class politics mm -hmm. of what's going on. We won't get a grip on this system, um, on this situation. So, uh, the, I mean, it's worth remembering when we're thinking about the TAFE case, and I totally agree with um, with, with what's just been said about that, um, that historically TAFE 
and a certain number of technical schools which were closely associated with TAFE was the one part of the whole education system that was substantially controlled by working class people. Yes. Not only in terms of the peoples who went there, the teachers, the connections with unions through apprenticeship systems and the like. That was a centre of working class culture. And the destruction of that whole system, I think, is a deliberate piece of class politics. Yes. I mean, the same mentality that says stop the boats uh, is at the uh, private school gates saying stop the kids. Yeah. It's exactly the same mentality. It's the same mentality of uh, preserving uh, privilege, and that's effectively uh, uh, what it does. Uh, if you're interested in, in the studies, I've quoted some of them in an article the public, called The Public School Advantage. It's on the Bible and Teachers Federation website where I cite some of the studies that show there is no advantage in sending your kids to, to private schools. But it's really, as I think as uh, Ronan quite correctly said, it's really not about learning outcomes. It was about simpler, you know, learning outcomes and, and the evidence is clear. It's about something much, much, uh, much deeper than that. I'm really interested in what we just uh, touched upon in this idea of um, protecting the privilege and something deeper than um, what necessarily seems to make sense. Uh, if we looked at just the, the statistics of how well society operates and we want to all be a society where we have more educated people, hence we have public, good public school systems. But the argument that there's something deeper, I wonder if you guys would um, explain how this can be um, countered. Because it's, it's, it almost sounds like a conspiracy theory. And it almost sounds as though there's, a, there's this hidden message that we're not talking about. And I think that, I mean, um, I'm a, a teacher in a high school, um, and I'm very proud to be a teacher in a, in a public high school. Um, the idea that other the politicians or other people in society would not want to educate all of the children as best they can uh, confuses me. So I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. That's a very important issue, um, one which always comes up when we try to think about the role of social interests and social structures um, in what happens in, in, if you like, everyday life. I mean, there are conspiracies from time to time. I mean, there was one organised against Tony Abbott not long ago. Um, but what we're talking about is much bigger than the sense of a, a, of a conspiracy where people gather together and decide on a, on a policy. It's something that works at the level of hundreds of thousands, millions of people. It's something that's expressed through institutions, uh, such as the logic by which corporations work, search for profit as they move into a new terrain of profit making, like technical education. Um, and it's also to do with the, the shared um, assumptions uh, and the limits to how people think, uh, I think, are, are also quite important. Um, so the fact that the, you know, the Federal Labor Party uh, could be party to an educational policy shift, which actually reconfigured schools, not as part of a collaborative system, a cooperative system, but as competitive firms, which is what, in effect, my school does, or the same party, though, you know, 20 years earlier, reconfiguring the university system, not as the highly cooperative and equal system that it used to be when I came into it to, to work as a teacher, uh, but configure that as a set of competing firms, you know, controlled by corporate entrepreneurs, which is basically what vice chancellors are now. You've had a powerful shift which is in certain interests, social interests, and against others, uh, which is expressed in a shared culture, you know, the culture of excellence, competitive excellence, um, accountability, all of these buzzwords that have been imported into education from 
corporate world. That's the way these kinds of things work. And, um, you know, there's a certain amount of intent there. Um, there are policy decisions to be made, and the more intelligent policy makers know who are the winners and losers, they're not, they're not exactly fools. Uh, so when you get a very big effect, like the destruction of TAFE, um, I have no hesitation in saying there's an element of deliberation and intent there, not in the form of a formal conspiracy, but through the mobilization of social interests and the disregard and ruthlessness towards those people who are losing out from this kind of change. That's the kind of way I'd analyze it. Don't get depressed because we're going to win the Gothki funding model. We're probably going to be one of the few countries on this world that's actually going to have growth in the school budget. We've got, we've got four years of growth already and we're going to get it. I'm, I'm confident that we're going to, going to win this. We, 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 cannot, uh, we cannot give up hope, as they say. Um, uh, you know, the struggle's long, but hope is longer. I, I think what's, what's essentially happened uh, is the whole neoliberal agenda, which really, we got to a point where markets were saturated in many ways, and from the 80s onwards, and I'm a bit mindful that Raywin lectured me in Marx and Marxism 40 years ago, and I'm about to give what he might have said was a vulgar uh, Marxist uh, uh, analysis here. So, um, uh, but essentially what's happened is we've had this massive privatisation of most areas of the public enterprise, whether it be transport, communication, banking, and so on. And, uh, and uh, the last that hasn't been has been schooling. And what, and, and what has been, been behind that is essentially, effectively, uh, corporations that are, are much more powerful than often the national governments. National governments come and go, but corporations remain. And the corporate world has effectively have captured the notion that we they, they don't particularly want to uh, pay tax, they don't want to be regulated, they want unfettered access uh, to, to markets and governments that get in the way. One of the pesty things is you still have to educate children and you still have to, you know, you still have to have a hospital for, for ambulances to arrive at. So there are some things that make it difficult for them to completely privatise. But they certainly will be. Schooling is the last. And we believe, the union believes, that, that, that the privatisation agenda, the corporate privatisation, not so much the faith-based private schools that we've always had, but the actual commercial schooling is the next frontier that they've already begun. And they're doing it right across America and the, and the UK. Pearson is a very big company that uh, is, is, is involved in this. And it effectively is to, to minimise tax and to um, uh, take over and turn what was once a public good and a cost for, for governments into an investment strategy for big corporations. That, that's what I think we're seeing happening. And teacher unions and the teaching workforce are seen as enemies to this, and that's why there's quite an ag aggressive attacks on teacher unions, particularly in the UK and the USA and other places. I mean, and in, indeed, in some countries uh, where Pearson is operating, we even see uh, teachers being murdered. Um, we see Pearson as a big, big UK company, uh, one of the biggest uh, textbook uh, publishers in the world, now running for-profit schooling systems. Let's give an example of what they do in Ghana. In Ghana, they go in, they create the schools. There's actually increasing child labour in Ghana because what they do is they charge fees, um, and the fees can be ending up to 40% of the family income, and they give kids rubber wristbands. Those who haven't paid get one colour, and those who have paid their daily fees get another colour. And Pearson's operates right throughout the US. They captured whole states over there. They're in Australia. They're running NAP plan tests in Australia. They have, they have, um, they uh, really, um, uh, at the, large, the largest edgy business, what we call the largest edgy business. And, uh, um, and it's effectively the corporatisation of, of the world. That's why one of the reasons why we've got, when we say the Gonski campaign is a critical campaign, at the back of our mind, we're not just seeing more money for our kids in schools, although that's critical for us. We're also seeing it as a bulwark. If we can save the public education system and make it stronger, we're also as a bulwark against the neoliberal agenda. So it's more than just a reference point. Yay! We've got another 10 minutes to go yet. Yeah, hi. Kieran, just a few questions for the panel. 
My name is Kieran. Okay, in the, in the emerging issues paper released by the Gonski Review, it says that, quote, equity should ensure that differences in educational outcomes are not the result of differences in wealth, income, power, or possession. However, as you've pointed out, neoliberalism sees education as a commodity, not a public good. Taxpayer funding for public schools has been increasing at just over half the rate of taxpayer funding for private schools. In other words, if we continue on as we are, we are well on the way to reducing our public education system into a welfare system of last resort for the children of the poor. How can we hope to, to remain or to aspire to be a social democracy and a cohesive society if we use public funds to entrench privilege and underprivilege through our educational system? And what are the long-term social and economic costs in allowing the lottery of birth to dictate dictate educational and life opportunities. And uh, recently there was a group of Finnish educationists that came out here and Finland's often exalted as a model of success in terms of educational outcomes and they noted that the Australian educational system was peculiar in that it was a marker of, of class distinction and privilege rather than a comprehensive universal right. Wow. I like your comments on that. And yeah, Finland has a free educational system, comprehensive, and they do not have any elite or private schools, or certainly no funding for those institutions. So your comments, please. Thank you. Well, that's, uh, you, 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 you've certainly reinforcing some of the comments I made earlier, that we are one of the most uh, segregated uh, uh, education systems um, uh, on the planet and, and getting worse. Uh, I make this comment in terms of what's happening in, in schooling um, in Australia. You, you, we, can't, we can't boast that we're a democracy. If we, just look at, if we just measure it just through our education system alone, our school system. We're not a democracy if we have deliberately uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, millions of children because of where the uh, situation in which they are born. And I think we've got to start to uh, talk about democracy in much broader terms in the ballot box every three to four years. And one of the fundamental um, uh, hallmarks of democracy is how you treat the, your children and, and the hope and the opportunities you give them. And John Ralston Saul, the yep. Canadian yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, philosopher and, uh, and author, said that if a, if a country ever gets to the point where, where more than 10% um, of their population go to uh, private schools and uh, schools of privilege, then you, you, you cannot boast any more that you're, that you're a democracy. So to me this is an absolutely fundamental point that, that, that you make. We're not only uh, becoming in that sense less democratic, uh, we may also be becoming a lot poorer. Um, and this I think is where uh, we may actually ha have some leverage um, uh, towards a more equitable funding system. Um, what you say is about essentially the residualization of the public uh, education system and the resulting decay in the overall um, quality of, of education, and that is very much Know, the, the situation we're facing. Australia is also facing now um, a major problem of future economic strategy. Uh, you know, nearly 30 years ago, Paul Keating declared, okay, we're at risk of becoming a banana republic and we've got to deregulate, okay, open ourselves to flows of foreign capital, deregulate labour markets, blah, 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 blah. In other words, that was the justification for neoliberalism. And what happened, therefore, was that you got an economy which boomed to the extent international commodities trade boomed, and the mining sector became the leading, leading light. Um, now, that's going. You know, we all know that's going. Even the Murdoch Press is talking about the end of the mining boom. Uh, what comes next? Uh, where do we go? I mean, Canberra has, is now you know, beginning to panic about this. And what comes next has to involve a well-educated workforce. Mm. And there are no two ways about that. If we are to develop an economy based on high technology, on services, on secondary industry, whatever it is, 
provided it's not digging up coal by you know automated means and shipping it overseas in gigantic carriers which produces very little employment gain <coughs> and doesn't trickle down as we've seen in the, the distri income distribution figures. Um, then a well-functioning public education system is absolutely necessary for the country's economic future. I think you know, that case can be made very powerfully right now and will, I think, help to drive the struggle of Korean Konski. Hello, my name is Paul. Um, I just uh, want to ask Mori and uh, the other academic group. What's her name? Oh, yeah. Um, look, um, I've had experience in, as a, I was a reader in uh, Port Kembla, and uh, the, the um, effect of, of the gutting of TAFE down there, with, uh, putting people off and going into trades or, and the, you know, into uh, the, the labouring jobs or something like that, you know, like, uh, that's been devastating for Port Kembla, and uh, it's, uh, it will be depressed. It'll depress the whole thing, you know. The, um, the, the, with the loss of jobs down there, um, it'll be devastating, you know. And uh, also, I've, I've worked in the university sector, and that seems to be going. I've been in engineering, and that seems to be going to an Ivy League system up there, you know, with a, looking up the full foot fee paying students, you know. So uh, there's a, uh, there's a one. One, uh, one part of the, uh, the, the, the um, one extreme to the other, you know, and uh, it seems to be more like the American model, you know, where they're, um, you know, it's uh, like you've got in, uh, you know, I, I went over to America and I, I went to Detroit, you know, I was going on a plane, I didn't want to be off in Detroit because uh, it's just been devastated, you know. They walk out of the houses and they strip all the uh, strip all the. Can you please come to the question? Well, the question is, what's going on with um, TAFE, and what's going on with the universities when there's two extremes? They're looking after the full fee paying students, the rich students, and they're devastating trades. People don't want to send their people kids into trades because they think it's dangerous. But if you don't, if you don't. Get food on the table. If you, if everyone can't be uh, looking at the computers or something like that, they want to do. They want to work with their hands. And if you devastate trades and uh, turn people off trades, and the money's not there, um, what do you do? You know, like this is it. You know. Good. Yeah. Um. And in the universities also we're seeing steady casualisation of the teaching workforce. Um, the same kind of process, the same kind of logic. And uh, I gave a very detailed answer on TAFE a few minutes ago, so I won't uh, repeat that. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's Give us a Wollongong perspective. Well, they're closing gap day TAFE. There's a Wollongong perspective. At the same time, that potentially we're going to lose thousands of people out of Blue Scope Steel and who will need retraining into other other industries, hopefully in industries like new technology, sustainable energy kind of industries, and we're closing uh, and selling off the local tape college. Lots of laughter. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to put your hands together for two wonderful speakers.